Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Murnahan Ancestral Monument Dedication. I want to let you know that we're uh, videotaping this today for a reason, and that is because of the many clan members from across the country who uh, have donated here to and made this possible. And I wish the, the camera's going to be on you guys, and uh, I just uh, wish you could uh, make some noise here and welcome uh, your cousins from across the Canada. Now, uh, first, I want to thank the Lord for a beautiful day. Hey, okay? isn't it great? It, uh, we've just been hoping for this, and I want to thank him, too, for watching over this clan uh, throughout the generations. Today, we're gathering to, it's all about honoring our ancestors, and especially the first family, uh, John, Mary, and Bernard, who come over here from Ireland. We still don't know much about their lives in uh, Ireland, but uh, we have some family history here that I'll, uh, from uh, the local, that uh, I'll let you know about. Uh, today, uh, it was 182 years ago today that John Murnahan passed away, and two days later he was laid to rest over here in the family plot. 
John uh, came over with his uh, four-year-old son, Bernard, in 1838. And uh, that kind of says something, too. Uh, Mary stayed behind. We don't know the circumstances. Uh, she stayed behind and came over in 1840. But uh, I was impressed that uh, not every dad can look after a four-year-old son. So I think it tells us something about John. Uh, John and Mary, uh, Mary come over in, uh, yes, 1840, and they put down roots uh, on a farm on the Tarantum Road, and I'm really proud to say that the ancestors are still on that property. Uh, John and Mary had six children, Bernard, Frank, James, Patrick, Dennis, and Mary. And after 20 years of raising the family, John Wife's Mary passed away in 1858. Three years later, in uh, 1861, John married Margaret Holland, and they had one son, Will. Yeah, for the next 32 years, John and Mary raised their family until John passed away on August 29th, 1893. Margaret lived for another 11 years and passed away on September 18th, 1904. When uh, Bernard grew up, he married Catherine Kitty McGuirk Holland. Uh, Catherine, who was uh, Henry McGuirk's widow, was raised in three children, Patrick, Alice, and Annie. Uh, Bernard and Kathy had four, or Catherine had four sons, John, James, Bernard, and William. And they farmed the McGuirk farm down the road for about seven or eight years. Uh, then Patrick McGurk took it over and Bernard bought the farm right next to the property here and uh, and actually that's where I was born and my dad was born there uh, let's see yes and after Bernard passed away in 1917 he willed the farm to his son William my grandpa my grandfather I already mentioned that it was 127 years ago today that John died and was buried two days later, and his wife Mary earlier. Uh, we are all keeping their names alive here by putting up this monument for future generations. And uh, right now, I'm going to we're going to proceed with the dedication of the monument. So I'd ask uh, Vince. Uh, Vincent J. Murnahan to come this way with uh, Father Daniel, and you can take over here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see some Andy Murnahan descendants here. Uh, this time, it gives me great honor and privilege to. Uh, to present uh, our new pastor of St. Patrick's, Father Danny Wilson. This is uh, the first official job he's to call it. We're happy to have him here, and we're happy that he's going to be here to do our monument. So, Father Danny. Coming along? Can you hear me now? Good. Well, welcome to you all. Uh, it's nice to be uh, here with you this afternoon. And uh, in this place where many of your relatives and friends uh, await the resurrection of the body. And uh, we're talking about, I'm uh, giving a little history there, but uh, Jesus would say, I know them. <laughs> they still live. Huh? And their, their bodies uh, await the resurrection, but their souls are, are with God. And uh, one day they'll be raised up, uh, like hopefully we will be too, to be, to be with them. So while we gather here in this sacred ground, we remind it that uh, where they have gone, we hope to, to follow uh, to heaven. And so we offer a little prayer. I see that most of the people here in this ancestral uh, cemetery came from 
Ireland, uh, I understand there's one from Morel. Uh, <laughs> that's where I'm from, I don't know if you knew that. Let us pray. O God, creator of the world and redeemer of mankind, who wondrously dispose the destinies of all creatures, visible and invisible. We sincerely beseech you to hallow, purify, and bless this monument, this cemetery, where the bodies of your servants are duly laid to rest. After the labor and fatigue of this life, pardon in your great mercy their sins and ours, and of those who put their trust in you, graciously grant unending consolation, awaiting the trumpet call of the Archangel Michael. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. It is indeed fitting and right, worthy and salutary that we should always and everywhere give thanks to you, O Lord, O Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God, through Christ our Lord, for he is the eternal day, unfailing light, everlasting splendor, who commanded his followers to walk in, in the light as to escape the darkness of never-ending night and happily come to the abode of light. He is the one who in his humanity wept over Lazarus and in his divine power raised up the dead, restoring to life that man four days consigned to the tomb. Through him then we humbly entreat you, O Lord, that on this day, and the last day of the angel's trumpet, you choose, you loose from the fetters of sin those who are buried in this cemetery, granting them everlasting happiness and numbering them in the ranks of the blessed. Thus may they come to know that you are our everlasting life, are merciful and benign, and may have cause to exalt you as their author of life and to sing your praises with the saints forever through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. May the Lord bless this monument and all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Vince. It's lovely. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. You're yeah, welcome. From the front is uh, the yeah. ones that came from our Yep, we're good. Yes, I'd like to call up Mary Ellen Callahan from uh, our Irish Cultural, Cultural Center, BIS, and uh, have her say a few words. Perfect. Thank you. Well, hello to everybody. Uh, I'm not a Murnahan relative, but uh, as, a, as my name is Callahan, but I am a relative in the sense that I also have Irish ancestors. And I was, I was looking at your stone, I was remarking to Vince that your relative, your original settler came over in 1838, and the Callahan relatives, who are my original settlers, came in 1839. So we're all related in the sense that we have Irish in our history and Irish in our blood. And as I tell people, I'm the historian of my family. And um, over the years, probably 30, 40 years, I've done a lot of history. And uh, 
I'm able, fortunately, to be able to trace my ancestors back to one generation beyond the original settlers. So that's quite special. So this, this, what you're doing here today is so, so important. Um, I had a gathering with my family in uh, 2018, and we had about 80 people, and I was able to put up some of my history up in a PowerPoint presentation, and also from Ancestry print uh, the, the, the map of our bloodlines, and I got such interest from people in doing that. Anyway, I, I got, I'm here because uh, I took a phone call from Vince at the BIS one day. I just happened to be there and Vince po phoned me up and said, do you have any Irish memorabilia that we could use for a dedication ceremony? And I said, well, I do have an Irish flag, so there she be. <laughs> Anyway, I'm the president of the Benevolent Irish Society, and for those people, some of you will know, in fact, quite a few of you will know about the Benevolent Irish Society. We're now considered to be a cultural center, and we're near, uh, we're on uh, North River Road near the Home Depot, and we're 195 years old, and when the organization started in 1825, we were there for benevolent purposes. We provided coffins for people. We provided uh, bags of potatoes on the table. We provided help for widows and orphans. And we actually had people in all the wards in Charlottetown who actually took letters of request from people to say, look, I, I can't buy coal, you know, to keep my family warm. Can you help? So we did that from 1825 to about 1950, at which time, you know, the social services took over most of that function. So now we perform more of a cultural um, aspect and, and less, well, we still do some benevolent things in the sense that we, we do help people if they have a need and they write to us and if we have the resources, we help. So I'm really pleased to be invited here and myself and Hazel White, who is also sitting with me under the tree, she's also on the executive of the Benevolent Irish Society. And I just want to make a note for everybody, something I've discovered. I'm almost 70 years old and I've discovered something over 30 years of doing ancestry research, is that if you have family members who are 70 or so, um, please make it a point to bring out the family albums and ask them. Them. Well, who is in that picture? And what's the story on that? And when did they come? And where did they go? Because it's so, so important. Because, you know, I have, am going to inherit family albums that have pictures in there of my ancestors, and they're not my albums. I can't turn them over and see the names on the back. So some of those people in those albums are, you know, my great-grandparents and my great-great-grandparents. And so while you have an opportunity to have people in your family that can pinpoint and tell you who the people in the albums are, please make it a point to do that because the opportunity, once it's lost, it's lost forever. So have a beautiful day, enjoy your family, enjoy getting together and talking, and most importantly, remember, you know, you are people of Irish ancestry. I'm fifth generation in Canada, but 200 generations in Ireland. So enjoy your Irish ancestors, and you know, thank God for a beautiful day that you can do this. On behalf of the Benevolent Irish Society, we welcome you. I have tried to walk on water I have tried to come rage and see With every step I would sink beneath the waves Then I turn around and see you holding me Holding me, holding me, no matter how, no matter when, if I should see you once again, you will always be holding me, no matter how, no matter when I should meet. How many times have I said that I loved you? More than once, itself is true. Then I turn around and see 
You're holding me No matter how, no matter when I will meet You're holding me Holding me No matter how, no matter when If I should see you once again You will all Holding me, no matter how, no matter when I should meet. No matter how, no matter when I should meet. Thank you. This is uh, one of a uh, couple of Irish songs we have. Actually, we have a few. So this one's called The River. And uh, it's kind of nice to be playing beside the river here. So we dedicate it to the river. Forgive me, Lord, I need to meet you there. for you, my Lord, is 
only a shadow of your love for me. Only a shadow of your love for me. Your deep abiding love. Life is in your hands. My life is in your hands. My love for you will go. My God, your light in me will shine. This monument journey has been, uh, for me, it's uh, started about two years ago. My uh, niece, Karen, was home from Boston, and during a family meal, she asked the question, uh, where's our ancestors buried? And uh, I knew my grandfather was buried in Charlottetown. I knew that Bernard and John settled in the Fort Augustus area, but I really didn't know. I assumed it was probably in this cemetery. Uh, but anyway, so that got me going, and uh, then I kind of forgot about it for a while, and uh, I seen uh, on uh, what's happening in Fort Augustus Facebook that uh, they set up a committee here to uh, restore the old uh, cemetery. So I come up here one day, and I was searching out the stones and trying to find a uh, connection to John and Mary and Bernard and and I didn't have any luck, so I was uh, leaving and kind of uh, down about it. And I said, Lord, uh, it seems this is a dead end. So I was driving down the road, and the thought came to me to uh, drop in to uh, see uh, Francis and Anne. And uh, so I pulled into their place up in Tranum and uh, knocked on the door, and they invited me in, uh, even though I interrupted their lunch. And uh, I told them I was there trying to find out information where John Myrna Hans burial site might be. And uh, the two of them looked at each other and smiled. And neat, I didn't know, but about a week and a half before that, uh, Francis had uh, pulled out the map he had 
that uh, his grandfather Mick had uh, made and uh, measured everything off the monument over here uh, to uh, Father uh, Alan McDonald. And uh, so anyway, one Pat, Duffy, and I and uh, Francis got together and measured it all out and uh, into this family plot here, which is the 10 by 10. And, uh, and on the front of it, you'll see uh, the names of uh, the history of uh, John and Mary. John and Mary are buried there. And then there's three names on the back from uh, Francis's branch of the family. And uh, so it was awesome uh, to uh, find all this out. And uh, we're pretty excited, or I was pretty excited. I know we all were when we uh, kind of staked it off and knew where it was. But then I kind of felt bad that uh, they had been in the, in the ground there for 127 years, John and, and, and Mary Longer, uh, and uh, there was no marker or no name, you know, to, uh, so uh, we decided, I talked to Vince uh, at the funeral home there and about a monument, and we uh, kind of drew one up and uh, got a price on it and whatever and put it out to you guys, and uh, so I just wanted to say that I'm really proud of uh, their response and uh, the clan members that I've met that I hadn't met before and conversations I've had with people across Canada. So uh, this is uh, really great. <laughs> Now I want to tell you another little story, and that is about a while ago, uh, my son Eddie said to me, you know, Dad, he said, uh, we die twice. And I said, what do you mean we die twice? And he said, well, the second time you die is when people stop saying your name. I, uh, he said, I never knew uh, anything about John and Mary and, 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 uh, and all our family there. And, but uh, since this project came on board, he said, look, you, you brought them alive again, right? And uh, it was funny because right at that time I was trying to think how we could involve our uh, descendants that we knew better, our parents and our grandfathers and grandmothers. And, and uh, so the next part of the uh, event here is uh, people uh, just uh, uh, have a list of people that want to come up and just uh, say the names or they can say whatever they want to say, but they're going to say the names of some of the uh, descendant or ancestors that have gone and just to make them part of this too. Uh, we live in a generation where we probably have uh, more money and two people working in, in a whole different aspect uh, that we can we can do this but uh, the ones that come before us had to fight to uh, <laughs> to put food on the table and, and uh, so I just wanted to make them part of it. So I'm uh, Right now, just before we start that, I'm going to call on Danny uh, Murnahan to come up. Uh, my uncle, Ivan Naylor, uh, wrote a poem. And uh, it just encapsulates, as far as I'm concerned, every Irish in immigrant that ever come over the here and what they were looking for and, and, uh, and what they were leaving. So I just want to turn the mic over to him. Just trying to make sure nothing blows away up here. Anyways, for those of you uh, that don't know me, I'm Dan Murnahan. I, uh, I'm Joan Lane's son. I live down in Dona. I'm really uh, glad and proud to be here today. And, uh, at this time, I'd like to thank Vince and the organizers. Uh, done a real good job with this, Vince. It's a really nice day. Yeah, so uh, keeping uh, names alive, eh? Ivan. Don't know much about Ivan, but I've learned a lot about this poem of his. Uh, it was written in 1984. It's called My Father's Farm. And uh, as I go along, I'd like you to pay uh, special attention to the second last verse because it uh, really kind of touches on base on what's going on in the world today in our country and south of the border. He, he, uh, 
It's almost amazing how we put that together. Anyways, here we go. My father's farm. I gazed upon this land today, where once my father trod. Behind the horse-drawn implements that turned our chosen sod. His father, too, sun up till dusk, with callous hands would toil. Clear the woods, stump and stones, reclaim the sweat-stained fertile soil. For the Irish had but one dream, to have a land they call their own. To replace that which the British seized and forced each from their homes. Ah, oh, it's nice to be where the soul is free, far from brutal laws and tyranny, to walk around on the island ground and, quotation, thank God this belongs to me. And to turn the sod with the will of God by the shadow of the spire. To feel the joys, watch your sturdy boys and their boys when they retire. And this is the second last verse. Sometimes we're late to appreciate the wisdom of our kin who worked so hard with what they had from loving hearts within. They taught us faith and tolerance that all mankind are brothers. The example set will never forget the plight and trials of others. Old bones lie still neath churchyard hill, hallowed forever it will be. And the ghosts echo now, words of a man with a plow. Thank God this belongs to me. Ivan Murnahan, 1984. Thank you very much. So, uh, so you making another trip there. I'll just do a dedication to the people I'm thinking of today. Uh, I'm thinking of a lot of relatives, but I'll start with my uh, grandfather, uh, Mike, and uh, his son, Joseph, who is my dad. And I'd uh, like to also remember my uh, brother, Peter, passed away a number of years ago. And uh, just one final person, uh, Diane Murnahan. I went to school with Diane at the Charlottetown Rural, and uh, we kind of we kind of done the cousin thing there. Uh, made a lot of laughs. We had a lot of laughs with that. She didn't know me. I didn't know her. But we come to know one another and had that connection. So uh, yeah, I was the country Murnian, and she was the towny Murnahan. So. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, thanks very much, guys. Yeah, I'd like to call up uh, Norman Mernahan Mer 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 or Mergen, I'm not sure what he, handle he uses, but uh, if he'd make his way up here, and uh, Al McKay will be next, and then Debbie Berry can after Al. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Norm Murnahan, not Murnian. I prefer Murnahan, but um, I just came over from Cape Breton yesterday, and I, I'm so glad that I made the effort to come here. It's certainly nice to be here with you today. Um, having been involved in erecting a memorial for my father and the passengers and crew of uh, uh, Eastern Provincial Airways uh, flight back in an accident back in 1965, but um, 50 years later, we erected a memorial <clears throat> for the passengers and crew, uh, recognizing their passing. But uh, I certainly know what's involved in, in uh, all the stages of research and, and planning to do such a thing. And I think uh, Vince and whoever else was involved in this uh, ceremony today should be really, really proud of what they've accomplished. 
Um, the folks that I would like to remember today, especially my father, Ray, um, who died on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I never met my grandparents on my father's side. I was at the cemetery uh, this morning and I, I noticed right behind my father's and mother's uh, uh, memorial stone is the stone for John and Ellen, I guess would be my uh, great-grandfather, and um, Patrick and uh, his wife, Mary, I believe her name is. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I'd like to remember my father and my dear sister, Melda, Mel uh, Murnahan Green, who just died uh, two years ago now, and I certainly miss her, great lady. And Tom, her husband, Green, is here with us today. And um, lastly, Father Pius Murnahan would be my uncle. Uh, he was a great guy. Uh, he was a bit of a mentor to me when I lost my father. But uh, I certainly miss him. And uh, so I'd just like to mention those three names. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, I'm Al McKay, and most of you are wondering why did Ben Skip put a microphone in front of him? But uh, I was just going to mention some names, and then I was sitting here, I got thinking of a story and just how the Murnahan part fit into it. So when I first moved home here and got a car, I bought a Volkswagen off of Gerard. Then the engine went, and I didn't know anything about cars, so we went down to Joe Mernion's and Danny, and uh, had to get uh, some help there also from Rus Russell, who was really good around Volkswagen. And we got the engine in my, my vehicle, because I bought a second one. I made two out of one somehow, I remember. And so I was driving that around for a week or two, and then Danny, he said, call you. Listen, Joe's after me. You got to get that uh, that other Volkswagen out of there. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll get it. So I asked Grandpa, can I put it up in the field there? He said, yeah, sure. So then I got a rope out of the barn and got my sister Kim. I said, come with me. Where are we going? And I said, down the Marines, and uh, we've got to get the car. So she was only 15, no license. So I grabbed the rope, hooked it on the back bumper of the good working car, front bumper of the car that wasn't working, and off we went. And I was scared to death we'd get caught by the cops. And so we headed down from Joe Mernion's down. We're going around that long sweep and turn where Danny lives there now. And I could see a car behind her. And we were only doing, I mean, a Volkswagen haul, a Volkswagen, how fast could you go? And I could see somebody behind us. So as I creeped around, I could see the horizon. I knew it was safe for them, so I put my hand out the window and waved them on and just looked really close. And then it wasn't passing, it wasn't passing. So I looked in the rear view mirror, and the car was behind me, but Kim wasn't there. <laughs> so I looked over my shoulder, and here she is on the other side of the road with her head out the window. What do you want? <laughs> so, but. I just thought of that today and how I bought it from Gerard, had it to Joe's, Danny and Russie helped, and there we go. Weird. But anyway, I uh, just want to thoughts are today with uh, my grandfather, Albert, and Mildred, and uh, then Eileen and Albert Jr., and um, then Irene Murnahan and husband Clarence and daughter Kathy and then my mother Gladdy McKay, uh, Murnahan McKay. So those thoughts are with me today. Thanks.
Hi everybody, um, I'm Deb Berrigan, um, and I'm pleased to be standing here today um, at this dedication ceremony on our ancestral ground, or near it anyway. Um, I'm here to share some stories about our branch of the family who lived at 59 Dorchester. And even though I'm one of the youngest of Will and Ida's grandchildren, I've sort of become the keeper of the stories since I had the privilege of being raised there in their house. Um, in 1921, William and Ida moved to Dorchester Street. Um, they bought the house with cash from the proceeds of the sale of the farm in Fort Augustus. I remember seeing the bill of sale um, many years ago now, I believe they paid around $1,800 for the house, and it was a three-story double tenement in Charlottetown. They purchased the house from two spinster sisters, um, the Cronin sisters, who, as the story goes, served breakfast to their boarders and packed their belongings and moved out in time for William and Ida and five kids um, to move in and serve lunch. So I guess they bought the house lock, stock, and boarders. Um, the boarders soon went by the wayside, though, because there were two more kids born in Dorchester Street, um, and that made seven in total. Albert, uh, you've heard from Albert's uh, grandson. Roy, Ivan, Alice, Mary, and Henry and Eleanor, who was my mother. They made a great team, Will and Ida. Will worked at carpentry, labor work, maintenance for the church, took the three older boys with him, usually, and they also looked after a stable that was attached to the house. Having the stable meant that the friends and relatives from around the countryside, especially Fort Augustus, um, would have a place to put their horses when they'd come to town uh, on market day. Meet me at Mernion's. Became a familiar ring. Even though the barn was gone when I was being raised in the early 50s, um, the familiar ring of meet at Murnahan's by that time <laughs> for the drive home still was a thing and I remember some of the people who used to come in and maybe say hello to I didn't have a cup of tea or something like that Corny Comiskey um, Charlie McGurk of course and Damon Lafferty a few of them Everything that uh, Pop and the boys earned um, in their work was turned over to Ida, and she would dole it out as needed. I know this because when I sold the house on Dorchester Street in 2003, I found an old scribbler with Ida's neat bookkeeping entries in it. She detailed how much was earned, where it was earned, and who earned it and how much she gave them back to spend. <laughs> As I said before, the house was a large one um, with an almost uh, self-contained two-bedroom suite in the third floor. Only one bathroom, though, on the second floor, and it was shared by everybody, just a toilet and a sink. Um, the bathtub wasn't added until 1949, and the room in the bath that the bath or the toilet was in wasn't uh, big enough for the tub, so it went in the room next door to the bathroom, which was, when I was growing was Ivan's bedroom, so we kids had to take our bath at night while Ivan was out playing cards. <laughs> As Will and Ida's children grew, um, they married and they were permitted uh, to move into that third floor space free of charge and share the bathroom <laughs> uh, until the first child was born. Um, and then they were expected by that time to have saved enough to get a start in their own. 
Albert, of course, built a place in town. Um, and then Roy moved into the other side of the house with, and started his family. Ivan, the third son, never married, and so he stayed in the room he was in. Um, and he and Eleanor, my mother, um, stayed home to help their parents uh, and raise their dead sister Mary's children between them and with Granny and Granddad until Granddad died. That was how it was done then. Everyone pitched in. And after Albert moved back to Fort Augustus purchasing his father's farm, we never, at that 59 Dorchester residence, paid for vegetables again because uh, Albert provided them as his contribution to his mother's care. So our grandparents' house became a collection of family. Um, when you lost someone through death or desertion, someone stepped in and filled the gap. My uncle Ivan, who, whose poem you heard earlier, stepped into that role as father to me and to my cousins, Billy and Vanda, um, who were more like a brother and a sister to me, because we all lived in that house. And my mother, Eleanor, or Mick, as she was known, um, became mother to us all. She was also a nurse and caregiver to her parents and siblings when their time came. And then when Ivan and Mom began to fail, I stepped into the role as caregiver to them. Uh, I'm sure it's a familiar picture shared by all immigrant families, not just ours, but I wanted to share this today because I can speak directly to how we became a family and how we stayed together. I have no memory, really, of John and Mary. I wasn't alive. None of us do. But um, I appreciate the fact that they had determination and grit and decided to make a better life for themselves and their family by moving to Prince Edward Island um, when they did. But I do remember their grandchild, Will, who was my grandfather, and I know something about their values through his values, um, about how he treated his wife and his children and how his home became um, a meeting place of sorts, maybe because of the stable. Um, I was privileged to be a little fly in the wall and absorb some of that history when I was growing up. They connect me to those grandparents, William Mernon and Ida Jane Finley Murnahan. And through Will and his stories, even though I was only four or five when he died, um, I do remember sitting on his knee in the old Morris chair in the corner and big tears in his eyes as he would sing an Irish rebel song and then he'd stop and he'd probably say something or other to Granny or whoever was in the room with us about his parents and his grandparents. So I absorbed a little of that. Um, Maybe not his storytelling ability, because I understand Will was a great storyteller. Um, but I'd like to remember his, uh, the rest of his children. Um, we heard from Albert's grandson and son. Um, and I'd like to remember the rest. So um, Roy actually was Bernard Roy Murnahan. His daughter. Joyce Murnahan Robbins, another daughter, Eileen Murnahan McCabe, and his son, Billy Roy Murnahan, who just passed here not long ago. Ivan Murnahan, my surrogate father. Alice Murnahan Smith and her husband, James Smith. Mary Murnahan Pilcher her son, Billy Pilcher, and daughter, Vanda Pilcher Chinnery, and her husband, Richard Chinnery. Both of them died last year, 
about a year, year and a half ago. Henry Mernion and his wife Catherine, K we called her, Lee, and their sons Lee and Roy Mernahan. And finally, Elner Mernahan Berrigan, my mother. I think they would have all been very proud of our efforts here today, uh, especially our cousin Vince and his continued contribution. And we thank Vince. And thanks, everybody, for listening. There, I even learned a bit about our family now. <laughs> yeah, the next uh, I want to call up uh, Vince and Jay, or, or the other Vince, whatever. <laughs> and uh, after him will be Martha Murnahan. And then Rita Corrigan. And following Rita will be Cecil Murnahan. Okay? Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, descendants, I'd like to uh, honor my past uh, descendants like I want to start with my grandfather. My grandfather was Mike, Michael Murnahan, uh, called Mick, and he married uh, Mary Dunphy, who we call Minnie. And they had five children. They had James, they had uh, Eunice, and Teresa, and Melvin, Vince, and, and Elmer. Um, they um, uh, my grandfather uh, died a pretty early young man, around 50 years of age, I believe. Maybe Anna would know that, but uh, she, he died uh, quite young. And my uncle, Jim, James, he was left uh, home to help bring up the rest of the family with my grandmother, Minnie. And they worked hard, like Anne, they got, the, got them educated, they got uh, Vince and Elmer and the, the girls educated. And my dad stayed around the farm and uh, they went on. So. Uh, Eunice, she married uh, our Redman, and they had two children. Teresa married Ambrose Coyle, and they had two, two children, two, uh, two girls. Um, Elmer, he got married, and he has four, four children. And my dad, uh, Melvin, he's got the two children, myself and my brother Mike. Uh, I have one child, Darcy, and... Uh, um, Mike has got Mike has one one child, uh, John. So the name keeps familiar really right through the whole system. Um, then Vince, like he went on to be a priest, Father Vince Murnahan, and he served in the diocese here of uh, Charlottetown, the diocese PEI. He also taught in the university for many years. And Elmer, he went to Ontario and worked in the uh, as a business associate. And Jim Jim stayed with my grandmother. And help bring up and, and bring up the rest of the children like they. He retired in the firm, and he stayed with her right to the last minute. My grandmother died in um, in um, April of one year, and Jim passed away of uh, March the following year. So they were together, arm and arm, down through all those years to help bring up my family. So I'd like to donate the, and dedicate like their memory to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, just while Martha's coming, uh, there you are. Uh, I just want to let others know, like, uh, not everybody contacted me and wanted to speak. If you changed your mind uh, after uh, Cecil's done, uh, we'll have an open mic here. So, uh, just so you know. father is Patty Murnahan, the Charlottetown clan. I think I'd feel a little bit better here if you were all in elementary school or you had skates on. But that's okay. I'm here. 
Um, I remember as a kid when Dad would be driving around Charlottetown, he'd drop into Ivan's and he'd say to Michael and I in the car, I'm just, I'm just going in for a minute. I don't know if they discussed the family tree. Um, maybe. Um, we were always told that there were three brothers that came from Ireland and the brother that we were a direct descendant of, we lost track of him. And so somehow, Vince, you've solved that mystery. Um, I worked out at Dona School about 20 years ago and uh, I knew there were other Marin hands outside Charlottetown, of course. But once I said I was from Charlottetown, they just sort of said, oh, okay. <laughs> Because I really didn't know any relatives that were from Dona. I didn't think I did anyway. Anyway, that was kind of fun. Um, big, being Irish was big in our family. Uh, you have uh, grandparents were Murnahan, Connolly, Hennessy, and then we always whispered McDonald because that was Scottish. Um, Music was big, the Irish music, um, and St. Patrick's Day was always celebrated in our house with a big deal. Well, I mean, we didn't go out anywhere, of course, but we were home, and I guess it was Mom's silliness in that she always did something crazy, like, I don't know, green icing on the brownies or things like that. I think the worst one was the green tapioca. If you can envision looking at that for lunch and having to go back to school. We had to wear green, of course. Yes. Um, Mom and Dad visited Ireland uh, for around 66. My sister Trish and her husband were living there. And we had some relatives um, that are another branch of the family tree coming down... I, I brought that to show you, as a matter of fact. Uh, so we, vi we had cousins that named Eileen and Lena that they visited in Dublin. And uh, all my family, like my sister Patricia, my sister Anne, Alan, who's here, and myself, we all visited that family when we'd been to Ireland. Um, they had... Uh, there was also another brother in that, far, uh, in that family that was a, a very good artist. So I had just been visiting some art galleries that morning, went to their house in the afternoon. It was just like visiting another art gallery. One of those brothers moved to Toronto, uh, a doctor, I think he was Morris, and we met several of his children over the years. Um, when Mom and Dad get, did go to Ireland, uh, Dad was bragging so much how Irish Murnahan was and it was a big name over there and all this stuff, but when they went looking to get those coats of arms that everybody would bring home, they had a really hard time finding the Murnahan one, and there was Conley coat of arm plaques in almost every shop they went in, so that was a little embarrassing for Dad. Um, Oh, when I was little, oh, there's been discussion about Murnian and Murnahan. When I was little, younger, for a number of years, we always said Murnian. And then Mom would say, if we're going to Moncton for our back-to-school shopping, if you say Mur Murnian, they won't know what you're talking about. So if we left the island, we had to say Murnahan. Although the cousins from Toronto that I had met had never heard the Murnian. And so... For different reasons, I really started saying Murnahan in probably university years. Uh, when a letter got spelled M-U-R-O-N-I-O-N, Murnian, I thought, that's it. Or I was, I was substitute teaching one time, and I was in a playground, and the kids were playing. And then one kid, thank heavens the name didn't stick, but he called Miss Murderhan. So I really had to get into saying that Murnahan just to make it work. Um, like a lot of people here, I'm sure an Irish wake uh, was part of our lifestyle. I think mom, anytime mom and dad, dad was the quiet one, mom would do all the organizing. 
every time there was a funeral in Charlottetown, they all came to mom and dad. So it was Irish Wake we, we grew up with. It was lots of, lots of fun. We met all the relatives. Um, and uh, 20 years ago when my mother died, we had an Irish Wake. And my daughters called it a family reunion. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, I brought mom and dad with me today in this locket. Anytime I do a little family thing, I bring this locket because dad had given it to mom years ago. And in it is dad's picture from 1929 green card. So they're here today with us. So thank you. Nice to see you all. And uh, nice meeting most of you eventually today. so they can hear me. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a beautiful day, and I'm glad to be here for this dedication. Um, I'm Rita Murnahan Corrigan, uh, daughter of uh, Dennis. Uh, my grandfather was um, Michael, and my grandmother, uh, Joanna Brazel. Um, okay. My sister-in-law, Larry's wife, my brother's wife, is here with me today, and I'm glad of that. Joe couldn't make it because he wasn't feeling up to it, or my husband. My father, Dennis um, Raymond, son of Michael and Joanna Brazel, Murnahan, um, grew up, I guess, where Francis and Anne live today, um, not in the log house, but in the house that Francis and Anne now live in. Um, he married Viola Trainer, but before he got married, he lived with um, two of his aunts down handy where Elaine and Joe's farm is. And then he married Viola Trainer in 1944, and they had five children, myself, Carol, Lois, Larry, and Russell. And they settled in Dona on Joe and Alice Murnahan, Alice Breslin Murnahan's farm. Um, and they have 10 grandchildren, 21 great grandchildren, three great great grandchildren. Uh, the homestead still belongs to Russell, the youngest brother and is maintained by Joanne Coyle Murnahan uh, and her granddaughter, M Madison, who still reside there, and this is important to us as a family. Um, one of my father's phrases was, <clears throat> uh, it will all be ahead of you, and here we are today. Um, Dad passed. Uh, February the, the 11th, 06, and I own my mother, passed October 2017. Uh, I had the pleasure and the um, luck to be to go to Ireland in 09. It was a, a beautiful trip, and I would go back again if I ever ever had the chance. And I'm so happy, Vince, and thank you very much for all the work you've put into this. It's wonderful. And I didn't realize that there was not, never was a headstone until today. And um, so thank you to uh, you and anyone else that helped out Pauline with the guest book there. And, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here and a great crowd. Thank you.
No, no, Leo can do that. How are you, Sal? That's good. Get this a little bit lively here for you somehow. Thank you, Rich, for calling that day. And I said, hmm, wonder where did Vince get the idea to call Cecil and come up and say a few words in front of my family? Then I just thought, hit me, Merle. <laughs> but that's okay, because she changed my diaper and stuff when I was a young infant and stuff. She paid her dues with me. So, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of our family. Murhan family, let's keep it strong, because that's what we need to do. My name is Cecil Murhan, and I'm the youngest of 15 children to marry Nanda Murhan. My mother died in 94, and dad followed in 2000. We had two infant brothers, James and William, buried on this side on the cemetery. Our parents, Mary and Andrew, brothers Freddie, 82, Kenny, 2015, and our sister Loretta in 2019, buried in the new side of the cemetery. Let's keep the Bernahan name strong with the look of the Irish. And, uh, you know, it's quite something to whatever he can on some kind of a ship or something and pretty well sailing depending on the winds and the calm waters and stuff way back in that time had to be strong had to be wise to you know the direction to keep the straight and stuff and to get from way over there to here and sometimes if we have to travel to Tignish or Summerside or off island you'll complain God it's two hours away imagine back then Footsteps. I'm out for a walk today for six kilometers. Takes about an hour. That was that'd be nothing for them. And I don't know. Tom and Marlene might know this story, but I don't know which one it was. But I don't think there was midnight mass up here in Fort Augustus. And one of the maybe it might have been my great grandfather. He would walk from Tarantum to Vernon River to go to midnight mass. I don't know if any of the rest of you know that story. If you do, say something. You know anything about that, Francis? Who was it? So that was Danny? That's something, isn't it? Like he probably knew a path there to cut across farms and stuff, but but just the the gold of midnight mass, he wants the gold. And that that's quite something. So when you have to park a little bit further away, when you go out somewhere and stuff, just think of it then. Don't mind the steps. They're good for you. Thank you, Saul. Have a great afternoon. Okay, I said there'd be an open mic. If anybody else wants to come up and say anything, uh, I'll just uh, step back here for a couple of minutes and see if we get any takers. And following that, I'm going to call on Vince to come up and uh, Pat Duffy to join. Thanks, Vince. I just happened to notice this is the right height there, so I have to jump up. Uh, <laughs> My name's Paul Murnahan. Every week I would get a question, is it Murnahan or Murnian? And uh, I'd say, well, can you spell Murnian for me? So after that, it's always been Murnahan. And I'm glad Martha mentioned that. I was in Ireland with the coat of arms 10 years ago on a golf trip, and everywhere I go, where's County Murnahan? They'd be looking at me, what are you talking about? So there's County Monaghan, so it was very difficult. Uh, I didn't plan to send any words at all, nothing prepared, but uh, certainly the memories hit me here uh, with uh, the house next door. And basically grew up here with uh, Ab and Mildred, looking around, the cousins, uh, certainly Al, 
Eddie and everybody else we spent the summers with, the Lunds and the Gallants, and uh, anyway, a lot of great memories. And I'm sitting here thinking, that, as Cecil mentioned, how, how hard it must have been for those generations over the years, and each generation gets easier and easier, and I think how, uh, how life is so easy for me. But then I think of the story of <clears throat> this summer, actually, uh, Dad broke his ankle, so my 13-year-old son, I said, we're going to go over and cut Mom and Dad's grass grass. And he says, no, I'm good. I said, pardon? I'm good. And he said, no, you're going to come over and cut the grass. No, I'm good. And I went on a rampage. And I was, when I was your age, you know what I did? I was over there doing the hay and doing the wood and starting a tractor with a crank and then it went on and on. And finally he knew I was pretty mad. He says, okay, let's go, Dad. Okay. <laughs> so we're driving there and halfway through he just turns to me. He's pretty dry. He says, different times though, Dad. Different times. And so... There are definitely different times, but uh, I'm certainly thinking of uh, Ab and Mildred quite a bit, and, and uh, another name comes to mind, certainly Father Brady Smith as well. So, uh, <clears throat> My parents, Gerard and Paul over here, and I have two younger brothers, uh, Ryan and Mark, and uh, on behalf of us, uh, Vince, thanks very much for putting us together. It's a, yeah, it's a great honor, so thank you. Okay, I don't see anybody else up. Though. So I'll get Vince and uh, Pat Duffy to come up, please. And I guess I just say, uh, I guess I couldn't help but think about uh, the trip they'd be making over here in 1838 and 1840. And, uh, and if it hadn't been a safe trip, if they hadn't got here, none of us would exist. I mean, that's kind of uh, profound, right? So uh, anyway, Vince, it's all yours. Thank you, Dealer Vince. Uh, back last, <clears throat> last winter, on the one stormy day, the door opened down the funeral home, in comes Dealer Vince. So he said, uh, Vince, I have something here in mind, like a... So when he uh, was saying, <clears throat> Dealer Vince came in one day, one stormy day, and he said, I'd like to see you, like I got something in mind here. I've been thinking about it for two years, researching it, wondering, like, hey, I think we should do something like, hey, in honor of our descendants. I'd like to read you if we could do a monument. He said, could you take a look and see if we could design one, forget whatever cost would be, and go from there. So we got the drawings, Vince made us some ideas, we got the drawings sent up and, and uh, of what the monument could look like and would look like, and he said, uh, I would like to send out, like, all the information to all the possible descendants I can come up with, to be able to see if they would be interested in, in giving some monies to help finance this. And he said, if that happens, it's wonderful. If it doesn't happen, he looked at me, we'll, we'll do it. And we agreed, like, we would do it one way or the other, this monument was going to happen. And as you can see, here it is. Beautiful monument, like an honor of our descendants, okay? So uh, what we decided to do then, if, in fact, there were more monies coming in than we needed to look after the uh, cost of the monument, we would donate those monies to the committee that's looking after the cemetery. So it's it's great honor and privilege right now to be able to call Pat here, he's the chairman of the committee, and to present a thousand dollar check to the committee. Now, when this uh, <clears throat> when the expenses are all finished, when we know exactly what we have, there may be there may be a few more dollars available. If there, that will go back to the, to the committee also. Uh, so once they, uh, we would like to probably leave it open until the end of September. There may have been some of our descendants who didn't have an opportunity or didn't hear or whatever like a, to be able to contribute and help us. If to do it, they still can if they wish to do that. So we're going to leave it open at the end of September. Whatever funds are done after we've done the transparency of all our costs and our income, if there's money left over, they'll go to the cemetery fund. So right now I'd like to call upon Pat Duffy to uh, present this check of a thousand dollars. Thank you, Vince and Vince. 
and the other events that are out there that haven't been included. Uh, it's been a, a tremendous uh, dedication ceremony and uh, a credit to all the organization that you did and the support that uh, you had uh, uh, from your uh, family members uh, as well. Uh, I've attended a lot of ceremonies in a, in a graveyard, but I think this is the first time I've attended one where we're not burying somebody. So this is actually a, a very positive uh, step uh, forward. Uh, I, I hope that uh, when this concludes that you take some time to wander through the cemetery and uh, note uh, with the, uh, a number of the headstones uh, up in this area here uh, we were able to have a lot of them washed off and it reveals the intricate uh, details that are on a number of them and you'll notice that down that half uh, those haven't been washed yet uh, that's because uh, there were no Murnahans buried down there <laughs> But, but, but now we may be able to do it. <laughs> uh, if, as you go through there too, you'll also notice that at the, on some of the headstones uh, there's inscriptions indicating where they had immigrated from. And uh, the vast, vast majority, of course, are Irish descendants. And it'll indicate uh, that they immigrated and maybe in such such a year from Ireland and it may be County uh, Fermanagh, County uh, uh, Monaghan, Kerry, uh, Wexford, Ford, or whatever. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, I think in that far corner over there, there was one very proud Irishman that indicated on his stone that he immigrated all the way from Morel. <laughs> And uh, uh, Father Danny had mentioned that uh, at the beginning. Uh, also, uh, you'll also go through and you'll notice that, uh, you know, there are a number of repairs that n need to be done. Uh, there are uh, 10 or 12 stones here that the cross on the top has fallen off, and that will be reattached and repaired uh, this year. Uh, there are also, unfortunately, about 10 to 15 stones that have fallen over. Uh, they're broken. Uh, we will repair those, the ones that we can put back up standing, that, that will happen. For those that are beyond repair, uh, we'll probably just maybe have a slab of cement to clean them off, lay them on there, and perhaps a, a monument beside it to indicate uh, what was written on the stone for whatever we can determine uh, from it. Uh, there's also a number of stones that are leaning right there and they need to be straightened up because when they fall unfortunately they get damaged and then uh, it's uh, extremely uh, costly to repair the damage that is done to it. Uh, once we have our stones uh, secured and we have them cleaned uh, off, the next step is then to uh, erect a monument uh, here to all the uh, people that are buried. We have a, a, a committee currently going through the church records to identify the people that are buried in this cemetery. And believe it or not, there are well over a thousand graves right here uh, in this uh, cemetery. But the majority of people buried here, they have no stone. And so we want to erect a monument that will have everybody's name on it, but we also want to indicate uh, the names of those people that uh, are buried here. And uh, uh, they are our ancestors, and uh, we don't want to forget them. And as uh, Bench's son, Eddie, said, uh, you know, we die twice. I've never heard that stated before, but it's very profound and, and very, very true. And I think that's probably one thing that I'll definitely take out of this afternoon is that when people forget about you and stop talking about you, uh, you truly are dead. And so with that uh, monument that we were raising funds to erect, our ancestors will live on forever. Uh, there is uh, there's one more thing I'm trying to uh, think of uh, what I need to mention anyway. Uh, so 
when those when the monument uh, is uh, erected, uh, we'll uh, definitely have a dedication ceremony for that. I hope that uh, this ceremony is the beginning of a number of ceremonies that will be happening. There is a, uh, a gravestone directly in front of me here, the black one, I believe, Hughes is the family that's on it. They didn't have a ceremony, but about a number of years ago, they erected a stone such as, as you people did, and they listed their uh, ancestors. I know through the Duffy clan, there's at least five Duffys buried here that have no stone, and so we are going to uh, look at uh, erecting a stone to honor those people and to uh, uh, commemorate uh, Peter and Bridget Duffy, who were the original settlers that came out here too. Although I don't know how we could possibly top the performance that uh, is here. I, I do know we have uh, relations uh, to the Murnahans, so uh, some of you may get called upon for uh, double duty. And for those of you that are within the Duffy clan, uh, when you see my name pop up on your phone or on the emails, don't delete or hang up and uh, reach for your pocket. <laughs> anyway, uh, in conclusion, uh, thank you very much for this uh, donation. It's very, very much uh, appreciated. And uh, stay and go through and uh, meet your relatives that are here uh, above ground and below ground. Thank you. Well, once again, I want to thank the Lord for a beautiful day. Uh, this could have been uh, terrible if we had to, had to try and do it in the rain and whatever. Very thankful for that. Anyway, uh, before our last song, I uh, just want to thank some people. And I wish I should have thanked uh, Father Daniel uh, earlier. Uh, but please pass that along to him, uh, Vince. I uh, appreciate him very much. He's done a beautiful uh, dedication. And uh, let's see now. Yeah, I uh, really want to thank uh, Wayne and Natalie, you know, for the atmosphere they've uh, made for us here today. It's just uh, been awesome. Yeah, just great songs. Uh, I was going to say a bit about uh, the restoration project, but Pat. Uh, nailed it all uh, on the head. It's a really worthy cause, uh, and I know it affected me when my ancestors didn't have a stone, so I'm sure uh, to put their names on a monument would uh, be something special. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Wayne and Natalie here. We've got a Irish song we're finishing off with, and uh, you're going to have to get up on the chorus and join in. All right, then they'll sing that through two or three times. Yes, we got another big thank you, as uh, Vince said, to God for such a nice day here. And the rain held off, so thank you, Lord. And we got a f one final song here, an Irish song, and I hope you sing, sing along with us, and or uh, whistle, or whatever you want. I just want to say a couple of words, too. Uh, I hear a lot of stories from Elaine Murnahan, uh, Wayne's mother. I have to think of my words here. Um, and... A lot of the stories that I heard here today, uh, I find that uh, th these talking about traits and how strong people or your ancestors were, um, I, there's always these words that come out to my mind. I think they have a lot of determination, those murdy hands, <laughs> determination, strength, 
and a strong sense of family and support. Like the, the stories that I've heard from Wayne's mother are just amazing how the families used to get together and help each other out through farming or, or help raise each other's uh, grandkids or children or be there for each other. It's just amazing. So they really had a, a strong sense of family and, and the strength and determination. It's just amazing, the stories that I hear. If you ever uh, get a chance to go and sit with Elaine someday and hear some of those stories, they're just amazing. It just, uh, it's really heartwarming and, and it really sticks to someone's mind, that's for sure. And it's funny, she doesn't read it out of a book either. No. Nope. all up here. <laughs> <laughs> but we're jotting it down and we'll write a book someday. <laughs> By lonely prison wall, I heard a young girl calling. Michael, they have taken you away, for he stole traveling's home, so the young might see the morn. The prison ship lies waiting in a bay. Small free birds fly. Our love was on the wing. We had dreams and songs to sing. It's lonely round the fields of Athens, right? By a lonely prison wall, I heard a young man calling. Nothing matters, Mary, when you're free Against the famine and the corn I reveled and they brought me down Now it's lonely round the fields, rough and rye on the wing, we had dreams and songs to sing, it's lonely around the fields of Athens. By lonely harbor wall, she watched the last star falling, as the prison ship sailed against the sky. Sure, she lived in hope and pray for her love and back no pain. It's lonely around the fields of Athen Rye. Oh, lie the fields of Athen Rye, where once we watched the small free birds fly. Our love was on the wing. We had dreams and songs to sing. It's so lonely around the fields of Athens, right? We had dreams and songs to sing, and all kinds of things to do. It's so lonely around the fields of Athens, right? Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. We just have one more song here that's a major dedication here for the, this event. And it's a, it's a well-known song too. I am down and no 
my soul so weary when troubles come and my heart's burdened me and I am still and wait here in silence until you come and sit a while with me you raise me up so I can stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me more than I can be. There is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart be so imperfectly. But when you come and I am filled with warmth, I glimpse eternity You raise me up So I can stand on mountains You raise me up To walk on stormy seas I am strong When I am on your shoulders Raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up to more than I can be. Thank you. My name is Pauline Mernon. I'm a Mernon. <laughs> um, my dad always said, Mernon was good enough for his dad, so it's good enough for me. But my brothers are in Murnahan. <laughs> and I'm Murnahan if I need to be. Anyway, this is my daughter, Lisa Garland Baird. And um, I just wanted to bring a few, I really just wanted to thank Vince. That was what I was started out as. But, and so first I would like to say, uh, I want to remember Dad's family, my, my grandmother and my grandfather, Michael F. And the, he was called the Upper Mick, because Vince and Jay's father was, grandfather was the Lower Mick in Tarano, in the big community of Tarano, and, uh, and my grandmother was Johanna Brazel, and their family, and they, are, they were on the homestead, and I do remember the old log cabin. As a kid, Anna, I remember playing in the yard, and uh, the old house was there, and we were allowed to go in it, but we weren't allowed to go upstairs because my uncle Dolph, Rudolph, would say, you'll fall down through there, so don't go up those stairs. So I do remember in your yard where Francis and Ann are presently living today, and uh, I do remember that. So I guess that is the house that John and Mary built. So the six boys were raised there, and I just want to remember every one of them and we still have one of them with us. Unfortunately, he's in the hospital. 
Uh, but anyway, that would be my Uncle Johnny. And Johnny is 98 years young, and he had a little uh, mishap and broke his leg, and presently is recovering in the hospital. So there were six sons that lived there. Um, Ru Andrew was the oldest, Cecil and his 14 siblings, uh, and then there was Rudolph, and three adults are here today, Anna and Bertie and Francis, and uh, then there was Dad, Stephen, and about two of us are here, there were just three of us, my brother Basil and I, and then there was where am I? Dennis and Rita spoke on behalf of Dennis's family. And then Johnny, who's in the hospital, and there's three or two or three Johnnies here at least. And then Joe. And of course that's our good music came from Uncle Joe and his Elaine and his family. And I know there's two or three Joes here today. So anyway, that's all. And so what I wanted to say was thank you very much, Vince, for for instigating this. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be enjoying this lovely time we've had here today. And thank the Lord for the good weather, yes. And Lisa has another side to add to this because she is uh, fifth, sixth generation from John, but she's fifth, fifth generation from two of the brothers. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, so it's interesting when you're a teenager and you first hear that your parents share the same great, great, great grandfather, grandparents. It's a little bit disconcerting actually because uh, you start to wonder about all kinds of things about your origin. But then as you start to see how those families branch out, um, just how diverse the family does become, but that name does stay, it, it remains. So my, um, on my mom's side, um, it would have been the son of John um, Dennis. Dennis, and then on my dad's side, uh, John's son, um, James. I can't keep all these names straight because they're all named Mary and Patrick and James, and they're all named the same thing. Um, but interestingly enough, um, I also had an opportunity to be in Ireland, uh, well, it's probably close to 25 years ago now, and um, my great-great-grandfather, Mick, who was married to Johanna Brazel, um, I spent time with the Brazel family in Ireland in actually a little village that um, was once just all Brazels, stayed in a 300-year-old thatched roofed cottage. It was no longer thatched, but the cottage was original to the area. And um, I guess the other thing I would say about, uh, I think, Irish heritage is the unity that we experience, whether you are related or not, whether you come from a particular clan or not, no matter what um, part of the world when you meet someone who is Irish um, of descent or, or from Ireland, there's, uh, there's a kinship there. And um, I think I certainly am feeling it here today. Um, I think I've really enjoyed hearing all of the stories um, and bringing to life again all of these folks who are no longer with us. Um, and just thank you very much for everybody, for everybody who contributed to this. I just came and enjoyed it. So <laughs> thank you. And thanks, Vince. Well, that concludes our uh, dedication day, and uh, again, very thankful. Uh, if anybody wants a PEI flag here that I had to divide off stuff for COVID, and just help yourselves, uh, do me a favor. And uh, so anyway, we just uh, thank uh, all of you for coming, and uh, I hope you'll remember it, uh, and uh, had a good day. Thanks a lot. Yes, and if anybody like wants to come over and get pictures taken or anything there on the monument uh, before you sleep, feel free. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs>